In election season, you will often hear crazy stuff. But I got to say, this year we've been hearing a little more crazy than usual. Joining us now, it's one best way to put seller, it, a little more crazy than usual. Best-selling author and columnist for the New York Times, Maureen Dowd, is with us. Her Yay. new book is "The Year of Voting Yay. Dangerously," and yes, it is the derangement Fantastic. of American politics. Also at the table, NBC News correspondent Katie Turr, who is covering the Trump campaign. Katie, good to have you on board as well. <laughs> Maureen, your book seems to, to illustrate vividly that the, these two candidates that we have to choose between over the next couple months, they just never learn. <laughs> they never, ever learn. Yeah, and everything's upside down. So you've right. got the um, Republican cozying up to the evil empire and the Democrat right. cozying up to Goldman Sachs. Well, you've got a Democrat as the Republican nominee. Also, Don't yeah. Don't forget that you, part. Yeah, two New York Democrats. Two New York Democrats <laughs> running for yeah. president. Tell me about exactly. upside down. Happy it's days are here up. again for right. conservatives. What it is. Right. So why is it, that, and you've chronicled the Clintons for so long, what, what is it about Bill and Hillary Clinton that they just never learn? never learn that they always most of the wounds are self-inflicted and you say they apologize only like when a guns pointed political guns pointed at them I don't know you know I I spent I started covering uh, Hillary when she was uh, running as Bill's wife and then I went up and covered her health care thing. And, and when mm. I was rereading my book this weekend, I was amazed. I was sort of gushing about her mm -hmm. and very supportive and, you know, trying to explain that the first lady was this ridiculous tightrope that mm -hmm. no modern woman could do. And, you know, so I was trying to figure out, I read a bunch of other Hillary biographies, and I was trying to figure out what happened to her, what happened to that Wellesley girl. What, ha was, what happened? Because Mika saw a clip, <clears throat> Mika, extraordinarily tough on Hillary Clinton <clears throat> over the past year and a half, saw a clip from 1992 on the Today Show. She was like, oh my God, she was so far ahead of her time. Yeah. Right. And so, so what happened? And so pure. I think the problem is that Hillary has, you know, it's, I'm not a gardener, so I don't know the right metaphor, but. That really like, shocks me because I really, I see you out <laughs> working. I totally see working, you the wheelbarrow. The, yeah, the weeds no. every day. Yeah. But there's a vine, or a killer vine around a tree. It's like she is a wonderful public servant who wants to save the world. She's always had that part of her and still does. Mm -hmm. But then there's a darker place that she makes decisions from a place of fear and insecurity. And that kind of trips up the public, public servant side. Right. So you always have the good side. And then she gets, you know, I was thinking, it's like Donald Trump has his wall, mm -hmm. but she has her wall. She, you know, that, and you saw it with the health thing, the defensiveness, the secretiveness that is so self-destructive to right. her. Now, speaking of Donald Trump, early on in Donald Trump's campaign, you seem to take special delight in Trump tweaking the establishment. Mm. As did we. I mean, we would, we would mock all the people that said, there's no way this guy could ever win. There's no way. His ceiling's 10. His ceiling. You seemed to enjoy it for a while because he really did make fools out of the entire political establishment. And media. And the media. Well, it was really fun to see someone kind of upset the golden apple cart of the consultants and all the money and um, I, I really enjoyed that. And I also kind of enjoyed him puncturing the neocons and saying, no, you know, W didn't protect us before 9-11. And even if he didn't do it when he said he did it, at least to critique the Iraq war belatedly or whatever. I mean, there were, you know, he was kind of a truth teller in the beginning until, it be, you know, he turned into uh, a not truth teller. <laughs> But that would so, be a liar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in his case, I've been trying to think how to describe it. So it's worse than truthiness. It's worse than truthful hyperbole. It's more like wishful thinking, like he wished he had been against Iraq from the beginning. Yeah. But I do have to give him credit. He, he turned against it. There's something in the book where I talked to him about it in 2006. He turned against it way before a lot of the New York cognoscenti. So... 
Well, he did. I mean, but it is really, you could actually borrow from Joan Didion. It's, it's the year of magical thinking. The world is <laughs> yeah. what Donald Trump wants it to be. He's in his own alternative he universe. Really? really? I yeah. mean, I, I wonder about covering that, Katie. I mean, it's... Um, it's not as easy as it looks, is it? No. It doesn't no, look easy no, when everybody's screaming no, but, at you know, Let me just tell you what I mean by that. Okay. Uh, because we get the same thing on yeah. the show here on a different level. Why don't you ask them the follow-ups? Why aren't you reporting on this? I mean, how many... How, it, it is like a cacophony of fantastical thinking and blurts and name-calling and untruths coming out of his mouth. How do you cover it and not get criticized for not covering it well enough? Yeah, there, let's put it this way. He has policy speeches every week or so now. Yeah. There has not been a day where we can just focus on that policy speech because there's another uh, a controversy exactly. or, another, or more questions about his business ties. And so people are mad at you about, for not Yeah, whatever, exactly. Well, there's just a lot of do. things to talk about when it comes to Donald Trump because he's as transparent, not maybe not transparent, but as as um, well known a public figure as he's been for the past 30 years, there's still a lot we don't know about what's going on behind the scenes, especially when it comes to his business dealings and his corporation. Who exactly is he tied to? What sort of money does he have invested? What well, sort of money ever do get to that? investors yeah. have? In <laughs> we do, but he doesn't answer it. And we would know more of this if he released his tax <clears throat> returns, but that is something he's not doing. You know, uh, on a, you, can, you can sort of track Trump, though, through the years by reading the book, by reading your columns, because like a lot of us, it begins, Trump is amusing, he's funny, and you love the fact that he sticks it to, you know, like the neocons, as you suggested, and then you come to the end of the trail in the book, we're not at the end of the trail yet, it's no longer funny. No. I mean, once, you know, uh, little Muslim kids and Muslim women start getting attacked. It's not funny. But the way, you know, I, I met Katie in um, Iowa. I told her what an amazing job she's doing on this campaign because mm -hmm. I'm sure it's hard. But the way I've always thought of Trump is like um, who killed Jessica Rabbit. So you got a movie with humans and tunes, and that makes it hard because he's a tune. So you you know you're <laughs> trying to cover him as a human, right? Yeah. Well, my question to you is, when you still talk to him, I assume, does he have any concept of maybe what is going on in the country when he leaves an area, or when it comes to little kids screaming down their Hispanic classmates, or or Muslim? Winning women getting the headscarves pulled off their heads in Brooklyn. Does he see any of that that's going on? I saw a clip out there? of a 69 year old woman that was actually punched outside of a rally uh, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, yeah, I asked him early on if, you know, how he felt about this violence at the rallies. And he goes, you know, I like it. It adds a frisson, you know, of excitement. So I think he is the ultimate. Huckster who is selling in the moment. It isn't ideology. It isn't values. He's just trying to make the sale. Yep. You know, it's it's his ego, and everything is sublimated to We're his ego. Well, one other so, question: Do you think he wants to be president, or does he want to be called yeah, Mr. President? That's a good Our reporters debate this constantly. Some think he doesn't want to be. Some think he's self-destructive. Uh, I think he does want to be because whenever I have met any man or woman who's told they can be president, it's like a virus in the blood. They want to be president. Uh -huh. They want the toys. They want. But Air is it Force that he One. wants to be called Mr. President? The toys around it, or does he want to get into office and, and be a civil servant? I think that he. Um, you ask a question that answers itself. Yeah. He, <laughs> well, he certainly doesn't well, he want to slink back to New York as a loser, right? Because then his whole brand Sad. is gone. Yeah. Sad. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The book is The Year of Voting Dangerously, The Derangement of American Politics. Maureen Dowd, it's always great to have you, thank you. on the show. And Katie Turr, thank you Katie for coming Turr, on. Katie Turr, combat pay and all. Thank you for yeah. coming on the show. Yeah. We're back in just a Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.